on. Hey guys, my name is Lauren Hollows and I am here with the lovely Vanessa McCarthy of Freakly Too Sweet. Hello. And today we are talking about the new draft standards. Um, lots that we're going to cover on this, I'm sure, over the next couple of months. Yes. Um, but initial thoughts. Initial thoughts, big statement. Yes. Uh, I think the, it, we're not ready yet. Yeah. Is my first big thought. It's like, don't release this just yet. Please, everybody, right at this point, I'm going to say, before we even go to any other detail, is if you haven't had your say, get on and find a way to have your say. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I say that is I know that the draft standards were created because there were a lot of concerns that the current ones were too prescriptive. But my concern is the terminology or the language they're using. They've introduced some things that are brand new and don't suit our sector. And I'm get very concerned that it will make it more confusing for a lot of people. And I think it's also important, very, very important to remember the draft standards are out. It's actually going to be a set of three separate documents. So there is going to be a credential policy, which has not been released yet and does contain a lot more information specifically around qualifications that should be held. Yes. And then there is also an actual standards document as well, in addition to kind of the overview. Yeah. And eventually that will all be combined into a user guide, but we're very far off from where we are now and there are bits of the puzzle that haven't been released yet. Yeah. So there's a lot of people making assumptions that this is the be all end all. And that's that's the big the big thing. So uh, acknowledging the fact that writing a whole national standard is not an easy task. Yep. And there have been a lot of situations where there's a lot of input, which is great. Yep. There are some people who are still saying stuff but aren't actually writing it in and providing that feedback in writing. So that's the first thing you have to be aware of. The second thing, as Lauren said, by having those different sections, they are staging out the release. And yeah. that can be a little bit more confusing than it needs to be, but I guess the other side of the coin is if they put everything out there, it's too much for people to take in. Um, and, oh, I don't know, I... I I'm, I'm of a mind if you're going to refer to something, then please give a date in which that will occur. And I'm not too sure that that's so clear. Yeah, I at the ASQA session that was specifically on that, they, they did mention January 2024 mm -hmm. is when they would be releasing the new credential policy. So, but that's only one section. There's another yes. like user guide thing, isn't there, coming out as well? I think they said the user guide was probably like a year off. Yeah. Um, And then the... But the other document that was going to come along with it, so all three parts of the legislation itself um, would be out in January 2024 when the initial pilot is set to commence. Yes, so there's still a lot, a lot of things to occur with it. Yes. But I think if we can talk to everybody about the language and the terms that are currently used um, and... The, I mean, the, uh, I focus on the assessment part, obviously, and yeah. the validation part. Which and is then, where a lot of people will Yeah, it's heavily focus. heavily focused on that. But there are some fundamental changes that if the what's going to happen happens based on this intent, then some of those things are going to be good. Some of them are going to be a little bit more challenging for providers. Um, but, yeah, we can go into each one of those sections anyway. So one of the areas that was mentioned at the ASPA session that had been raised as a point of contention uh, was the language between pre-validation mm. and testing. Yes. And I know that this is something that you are feel very strongly about, um, obviously being so focused in on assessment and how validation works. Now, the current version does have pre-validation of assessment tools, but they were talking about... Is that the current one, is October 22? No, there's, there's a new the version. New version. Yeah. So, so October, the new 20, version. Yeah, October 22 had pre-validation. Yes, now they've gone to testing. Now they've gone to testing. Yes. So, um, and I've spoken to so many people at the Bell Conference about this, um, and even outside of that, they're going, where is this testing come from? That's not the language we use. Since when do we test people? We assess them, if nothing else. Mm. Um, so if we were going to use a tool or an assessment instrument before it's used on on the general population or the public or your candidates, then surely that's a pilot rather than a test? Or are we looking at piloting or are we actually just looking at pre-validation? We all know what validation is because that's been done to death. And the understanding was why change it out of pre-validation. But 
When you read the information that's given out on these newer standards of 2023, they were saying, or the feedback they received is why they changed it. And I don't know anybody who would have provided that information. I mean, look, I think this is, it's been one of those contentious issues for a long time, pre-validation, post-validation, validation. Um, you know, it's it's consistently one of those areas that people don't understand. I mean, I I think it, there's a simple way of looking at it. I mean, for me, pre-validation is one, have we ensured that we've actually, I mean, it's a process of checking that we've ensured that we've covered it. And I think in best practice scenarios, you are then doing that testing process of, um, well, just, I don't like that word test. <laughs> well, I, 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 think you test, I mean, yeah, I mean, to me, testing, I'm, I'm assuming that testing in terms of what they were thinking was you're actually testing, you're, you're putting the tool through a process to ensure that it meets the standards. And my only thought process would be is that they've gone with testing instead of assessing because assessing has a very particular meaning within the standards and so they didn't want to confuse the two things. Yeah, but you say devil's that, advocate. But why then change from audit to assessment? Assessment review. True. That's a fair point. I have no argument for that. <laughs> so I have no if, idea. If we're going to use, I, I've always thought if you're going to refer to a term, the good thing is I'm sure they'll have the de definitions as they yes. agree with every legislation and every standard they put out. Yeah. So even if, worst case scenario for me, from my point of view, if they kept the word test in there, they have to be very clear about what that process is. Are they expecting to just see the test pre-validation of the instrument to the unit of competency? Or are they expecting to see a pilot? Correct. That's right. So that's one out there for, for the world to consider. Love your thoughts. If you can put them down in the, the comments below this. I'm sure Lauren will answer them. So as a as a pilot, is a pilot um, sitting with a group of trainers, looking at the tool, workshopping it, and, and basically like going, yeah, is this going to be appropriate? Or is a pilot an actual pilot of we're going to run it through a group of students and then adapt the tool? Uh, because can you run a... Can you actually run a pilot on a group of students with an assessment... That has not. I don't think that would been be validated. I don't think that would be like fair on anybody. I, yeah, I don't think. I don't From think. From a fairness, validity, and a sufficiency perspective, yeah, I see challenges. Of course, absolutely. I mean, then I guess it takes it all the way back to what is pre-validation, validation, post-validation. And to me, the development of the mapping guide is your strongest pre-validation process. Well, then I would. I mean, of course, being the, the owner and founder of Prickly the Swede, I believe all manual mapping has got something to be answering to because that's where the fundamental source of the problem of assessment is. A lot of people don't do it right. Yeah, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I would push back on that and argue <laughs> that the fundamental problem with that is is that people don't understand the principle of assessment rules of evidence. Correct. But they also don't know how to read a unit of competency. Like there is so much built in. Hmm. I mean you and I both know, Lauren, and I'm sure the old listeners do too, is that assessment is not an easy task. It's not something everybody can do. Writing, creating, designing, designing, yeah, reviewing, yeah, validating. So we need a set of standards to identify what needs to be done when and to the impact that the intent of the standard is trying to achieve. So if the intent of the standard is trying to achieve quality learning and assessment, then they have to define that word quality, which is something they've never done properly. How would one define quality covering the breadth, depth, and complexity of the sectors that we work in? Oh, I'm not saying it's easy. No. I'm not I saying that's, that's, that's the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think that, that is the ultimate challenge with that quality statement is it, is it looks different in all of the in all of the different components. Absolutely. Um, but I think that that is one of the big challenges. Like in terms of the new standards, the there I, I think that there's probably not a lot of RTOs that are currently adhering to the validation requirements. Yes. Um, I think that the five-year requirement of the old standards is a little bit silly 
in that it's very weak training packages update what you're actually delivering updates um your cohort can update so therefore having a five-year plan is almost pointless i think having a i think having a 12-month plan is a good thing indeed um however i think realistically anything past that is farcical yes and i and i think we're in the previous resources available by the uh regulator of noting at least two units yeah is so high risk for so many organizations that it just doesn't cover the yeah and i think the calculator is not a helpful tool either because again i think it depends on um and actually this was one of the good things that came out of the section the 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 one from audit express was you actually need to put your risk matrix to it first you know for example if you are dealing with um you know uh, traineeship or an apprenticeship carpentry um you know everyone's over 18 that's participating in it um you know it's delivered through one employer in a really well resourced workplace that is entirely different to delivering a you know a a diploma of nursing to an international cohort where english is the second language um you know where majority of it is online um you know and, and it's a it's a shorter duration than what we see in the market like yeah yeah you know it really does boil down to what are the risk factors that are associated with this particular course. And that that's a really good point. And one of the things I think that they're focused a little bit more on in these new standards mm. is risk and risk management. Yeah. Um, as well as the support required for the learners. Yeah. Candidates, students, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Um, which is different to the current standards that we're dealing with. Yeah. And that was certainly filtered through in like the risk prior, you know, in the, in the outlines of the risk priorities from ASQA is like actually looking at your courses, looking at your cohorts and kind of then making that determination as to, you know, how high risk you're going to be sitting in in like the VET system as it was, mm-hmm. you know. So if you are an international RTO or if you're an RTO that's delivering very short courses or you've got a very high proportion of RPL, you know, understand that you this is the category that we're going to be putting you into Mm -hmm. and so we want to see really proactive processes from Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. and you as you know each of you guys out there as rtos need to be looking at your own you know what you deliver and looking at the courses that you deliver and making that risk rating for each of the courses that you deliver and then working out kind of where you sit um in the big scheme of things you know i think it brings that governance back into play i mean they've done a lot of changes around the fit and proper person yes i think this sort of falls into the same quality reforms that they're trying to adhere to so there is some um regularity in their focus yeah which i think is really important being consistent and regular in the same questions and responses that they're putting out there is really really important for everybody and i think the standards have to show that as well yeah, and I thought, like, obviously, capability within the RTO, like the knowledge and capability of the staff, and I think in general um, there was a, a governance term that they were utilising, but their the ability to adapt, um, you know, to different shifts in governance uh, and, and how, your, you know, how you, your organisation mm-hmm. had an ability, whether your organisation had an ability to manage that. There's some things that are coming out referring to the fact that there's self-assurance isn't so prevalent in the wording and the statements what is your thoughts on that you chucked me a big question yeah i did <laughs> um fair turn about fair play um look i ha- i'm so two-minded about about the whole self-assurance idea um primarily because I've seen it go wrong so many times before mm-hmm. while I, and, and, you know, I think that to some extent there's a lot of RTOs out there that haven't been audited in 10, 15 years that have effectively been operating under a self-regulation model to some extent anyway. Mm-hmm. And those tend to be the RTOs that I walk into and go, 
Uh, but this is how we did it 15 years ago and it was all fine. Yes, I think that's definitely something that will be really quite prevalent because they're upping the number of audits or interactions. Uh, yes. Yeah. Assurance, uh, you know, assessment activities. reviews. Well, what are they called? Assessment activities, I think is what they now they But they, they said that they're increasing the number. Yes, they are. So if you haven't been audited for a while, it's probably a good time to start having a look at everything. Yeah, and look, I mean, if you guys are a Krykos or an Elikos, um, I I you reckon you've got a 90% chance of having a face audit, site audit in the next 24 to 36 months would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thank you.